אנחנו עוברים לדיון בתחום החוק הבינלאומי, כאשר הדובר הראשון זה דוקטור קנוט דורמן, ראש החטיבה המשפטית של הצלב האדום. דוקטור קנוט פליס, by all means. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a great pleasure for me to, to be here and to, to address this, I would say, this huge audience with people here in the room and then, uh, then outside. It's, uh, it's really stimulating also to, to listen to the talks that I, uh, that I was listening to this, uh, this morning. And it simply reconfirms my experiences from previous days in, in Israel that it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to be here and to exchange views. Um, um, just my task today or this afternoon, I think, is essentially to, uh, to do or to serve as a scene setter as far as the legal framework is concerned that is applicable in densely populated areas. Um, certainly the choice of the topic is a, is a very appropriate one because if you look at the, the many challenges that international humanitarian law is facing uh, present days, warfare, urban warfare, fighting in densely populated areas are among the most challenging topics. And this for a variety of reasons. First, certainly in terms of the human cost that uh, the fighting in urban areas can, uh, can create. And we have heard about this uh, already in the morning. Uh, it's not just only the, the direct human cost that is caused by, by, by the fighting in densely populated areas in terms of persons killed, injured, or then uh, caused uh, permanent disabilities. But you have also the, all the indirect effects of such fighting, which uh, has, uh, has a bearing on the on the well-being and the livelihoods of, uh, of the persons living in densely populated areas. And we should ne never forget, also bearing in mind what was said the, uh, in the morning with the democratic development that we have, fighting in densely populated areas will not be an isolated case, but it will be more and more prominent. So we should always bear in mind when we look also at the legal framework that whatever we say here in a particular context will have bearings also elsewhere. So we have to look at the, at the phenomenon really from a, from a generic uh, point of view and to bear in mind that it can happen everywhere. Now the other feature really when we, uh, when we talk about densely populated areas and, and warfare in, in this uh, scenario is, is certainly the recognition that such environments or urban areas are by their nature extremely complex. So military operations in or against uh, such areas will be confronted with, a, with significant challenges from a, from a military perspective. And here we have heard also some of the features, the, the commingling of combatants and military objectives with civilians and civilian objects, the fluid and often unconventional tactics used by defending combatants, and then the risk of sudden interaction with civilians. And these features clearly make it difficult uh, for enemy forces to, uh, to identify, or for, for the armed forces to, uh, to identify uh, the enemy, and then also the military objectives. It may be also much more complex in such situations to identify the likely incidental damages and, and casualties to the civilian uh, objects and civilian population. So, a challenging task for all armed forces. Nevertheless, despite these challenges, we have an important body of international law that applies in these uh, situations. And my objective today is really to lay out the, the ground rules that, that would apply. But allow me to start first with some general uh, remarks on the normative framework. So what is, what is the law applicable in such situations? The main rules that I'm talking about have been codified in the, in the 70s with the, uh, with the additional protocol 1 to the four Geneva Conventions and then to a minor extent additional protocol 2 um, of the uh, Geneva Conventions for non-international armed conflicts then. We know that, uh, that the two additional protocols have not been ratified by all states in the world, and Israel has not ratified, but you, you should be aware that at least as far as rules on the conduct of hostilities are concerned, it is more or less accepted that, uh, that the rules that I'm going to, uh, to speak about are widely recognized as being customary international law and therefore applicable in all types of international armed conflicts and um, very largely also in non-international armed conflicts. Then it should be borne in mind that the rules that I will talk about were meant and drafted to be applicable in all types of situations, including um, warfare in urban settings. And this is in a way also the reason why they are formulated in a fairly general and abstract way in order to cover really all situations and all methods and means of warfare. And therefore they should a priori be capable of uh, and appropriate also in, de in dealing with 
developments in the modern warfare that, that occurred after the rules have been, have been adopted. And one thing should be borne in mind as well, because I heard it a couple of times uh, this morning, uh, references to guerrilla warfare and so forth. Don't forget that when the, when the rules were negotiated in the 70s, it was against the backdrop as well of guerrilla warfare. And it was also against the backdrop that asymmetries in warfare may, uh, may exist and, um, and uh, that, that went into the negotiation. Now you can dispute whether the diplomats at the time got it right when they uh, tried to balance military interests on the one hand side and, uh, and humanitarian uh, imperatives. And you may also have to, uh, to, uh, uh, to undergo a regular exercise whether the rules remain appropriate in, in finding this appropriate balance. But um, in any case, at the time, there was consideration of these, uh, these aspects. Um, the other thing that one should bear in mind is as well that, uh, that these rules were developed also with the, view, uh, with the view that there may be situations where the other side will violate or may violate the rules. Despite the fact International humanitarian law is not built on, on a legal concept of reciprocity. So it means you have to apply the rules even in the face of violations committed by, by the other side. And there are only very limited exceptions that are still in, uh, in, the, in the rules which uh, allow for a limited amount of, of reprisals. But most of the time, reprisals are prohibited. The other thing I, uh, that one should bear in mind when you look at the rules is that due to the general formulation, they provide a margin of appreciation to the commander, which is absolutely necessary in volatile, complex combat situations where commanders have to take decisions in a, uh, in a matter of seconds. Compliance with the rules is therefore also assessed based on the information that the commander had reasonably available at the time of deciding on an attack. And the judgment on compliance is done based on that information, whether he acted as a reasonable commander. So one should resist any type of post facto analysis where, where, where you uh, are you going to analyze situation based on hindsight. What you have to do is what did, have the, did the commander have in terms of information reasonably available at the time. Now let's move on to the, more specifically to the legal framework. So the starting point of, uh, of the talk and the rules that I will address is uh, the, the principle of distinction, and we have heard about it. So the obligation that in all military operations a distinction must be made between civilians and, combat uh, between civilians and combatant, as well between civilian objects and military objectives. And then from this general rule you have a number of specific obligations th uh, that are aimed at uh, protecting civilians from the dangers arising from military operations. And these rules regulate... Uh, the, the conduct of facilities and they contain requirements for all parties to an armed conflict and all operations that they undertake in attack and in defense. So that's important to bear in mind. There was, uh, there was the mentioning uh, international humanitarian law is not concerned about, uh, about combatants and, um, and to, uh, the protection of combatants. Just bear in mind, although that's not the, uh, the main topic of my, my talk, there are certainly also rules on superfluous injury and unnecessary suffering, which have a, a particular bearing when it comes to, uh, to protecting uh, combatants. And then afterwards, I will certainly also come back on the issue of, of force protection and to what extent also the, the lives of, of soldiers can be factored in in certain decisions that are made based on uh, the or in the application of international humanitarian law rules. So when we look now at the, at the main questions that arise, uh, we have to ask a couple of questions. First, um, the question, which persons may be a legitimate, a legitimate target of an attack? And then second, which objects may be a legitimate uh, target of, um, of an attack? What I intend to do is to outline the general rules applicable to uh, uh, in, in these circumstances and then try to identify some challenges that will arise, particularly in, war uh, in warfare in uh, densely populated areas. So moving first to the question, who can legitimately attack? And if you look at the at international humanitarian law, humanitarian law, you have the dichotomy between civilians on the one hand side, which is the first category, and then on the other hand side, you have the members of the armed forces. Now, what are members of the armed forces? Because that's the term that is more specifically defined. Armed forces are all those uh, forces who conduct the hostilities on behalf of the parties to an armed conflict. And this includes regular and irregular armed forces of states, but also in this particular in non-international armed conflicts, the members of an organized armed group, which is fighting on behalf of a non-state party to the conflict. 
And perhaps there as well, when we talk about regular armed forces, one thing should be kept in mind. The regular armed forces are defined by the state based on national legislation. So uh, the, the example that was given uh, just, just this morning, uh, this morning when, when we talked about the military historian wearing a uniform and other, other persons, so it's a state decision to, uh, whether this person is a member of the armed forces or not. You can also have civilians accompanying the armed forces, which is totally foreseen under the Geneva Conventions, and those civilians accompanying the armed forces remain civilians and not, are not object of an attack. Obviously, by the presence next to military units, there is a strong likelihood that they may also become collateral damage under these circumstances. But here, just bear in mind, um, this is, uh, as far as regular armed forces is concerned, this is, this is a decision that the state normally takes based on uh, national legislation. Um, so as I said, civilians are then uh, defined as those persons who are not members of the, uh, of the armed forces of a party to an armed conflict. And only members of the armed forces are, and of organized armed groups are legitimate targets of an attack. It is absolutely prohibited to, uh, to, uh, to attack civilians or the civilian population. We all know this. And civilians, and this has been said as well this morning, are entitled to, to protection against direct attack unless as, and for such time as they directly participate in hostilities. Now, the big question is, and uh, there I think we have to, to be a bit more nuanced, uh, who belongs to organized armed groups and who can be seen as, uh, as participating directly in hostilities? And I'm not hiding anything when I'm saying that this question has been hotly debated over, over many years. That's also the reason why the ICRC at a certain point engaged in an expert process to clarify this notion. We didn't get uh, consensus at the end, and uh, the ICRC then decided to come up with its re recommendations how to interpret this, uh, this notion. But the one important thing that has been recognized by the ICRC also in this process is that members of organized armed groups, or you may um, call them the military wing or the armed wing of, um, of, um, of a party to an armed conflict, must be treated in the same way as, as well as the regular armed forces of a state. So we have applied a, a completely functional approach towards the armed wing, meaning that those persons who have a continuous combat function, meaning that they regularly participate directly in hostilities, they are legitimate targets of an attack at the same time or in the same way as it would be for the, for the members of the armed forces of a state. So the notion of direct participation in hostilities as it relates to, to civilians only comes into play when you have to deal with, uh, with um, persons who sporadically in a non-organized way take a part in hostilities. And there you, you have this, this concept that civilians can regain protection in the intervals between uh, uh, um, acts of direct participation. And here again, also the act is not defined narrowly by, by us in, in our recommendations. It is it's more broadly um, defined in the sense that also preparatory work and then also the, the, the leaving from a, from a site of, a, of, a, of an attack or of, of, a, of an act of direct participation would also lead to a situation where they're liable to an attack. So again, the importance to bear in mind is as far as members of organized armed groups are concerned, the same approach in terms of functional, um, um, uh, in terms of function is applied for non-state actors as for state actors. The other thing that one should in, uh, bear in mind when looking at, uh, at this notion is that um, generally you have a distinction, or quite often you have a distinction between the, the armed wing of a non-state actor and then also the, po uh, the political and the administrative wing. And to the extent that they are separate, you have to deal with them also separately and not just because they belong to the same party to an armed conflict that you, that you could uh, attack them. Again, the logic is the same between states and non-state actors because there you would also agree that if you have a, a, a purely political part of a state, this is not the, that those persons would not be liable to an attack. But this protection against attack only applies, obviously, that, uh, for as long as those persons are not involved in regular attacks of direct participation. If they are, they would assume then a continuous combat function as well and could be attacked. But this is something that needs to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis and based really on on the intelligence that, uh, that is available at a, at a certain moment. Obviously, in, non, uh, in densely populated areas, this, um, this exercise of identification is a particularly challenging one. And uh, I can only uh, subscribe to those uh, speakers who, uh, who mentioned this before. Proper intelligence and proper verification of the object is absolutely crux in the, of the matter. But again, 
not, uh, not the, uh, the perfect as required, and I will come back to that when we talk about, uh, about precautions in attack. Um, the other thing that one needs to bear in mind, once one has gone through this test of identifying who's, who's a person legitimate, or who's a legitimate target of an attack, if we come to the conclusion that the person is either a member of the armed forces or a member of an organized armed group with a continuous combat function or then a civilian taking a direct part in hostilities, that does not mean that you can proceed with the attack without further limitations. You always have to bear in mind that there may be other rules that apply at the same time, and uh, one rule has been mentioned as well in the morning, which is the rule of proportionality, meaning if you have then civilians or civilian objects in the vicinity of a legitimate target of an attack, uh, the, you can proceed with the attack only if, um, if you don't cause excessive collateral damage or, or incidental uh, casualties. I will come back to, to the test in a moment. Now looking at uh, which or what can be legitimate attacked, so the, the question of objects. And here, uh, based on the rule of uh, distinction, what is said is that only military objectives can be directly attacked. So far, so good. So far, so easy. But what are military objectives. And here, also again, based on custom international um, law, you have, or the military have to undergo a two-pronged test to assess whether, whether something is a military objective. So you don't have lists. That was discussed at a certain point that you have lists and all those objects you can, you can attack. But that was deemed at the time as not being practical because we all know that that in the course of hostilities, um, uh, the situation may change. So objects that may have had a, a purely civilian function may, because of their use, become, uh, because, uh, become a military objective. So a list approach was not appropriate. We have a two-pronged test that has to be applied. And the two, two prongs are, first, that, um, that military objectives are limited to those objects which, by their nature, location, purpose, or use, make an effective contribution to military action, first prong. And then the second uh, prong, whose total or partial destruction, capture, or neutralization in the circumstances ruling at the time offers a definite military advantage. Now, looking at the two, um, two prongs, I will just uh, highlight some, some main elements of a test that needs to be applied. So looking at the first prong, you, um, you heard the notion of effective contribution to military action. And there clearly, um, based on the, the notion of effective contribution, you need to establish a nexus um, between, the, between the, the use of the, uh, the, the, the use, nature, location, and, um, uh, and, and purpose of an object towards military action. So you need some kind of close link that, that exists between the two. And obviously there is a margin of interpretation and there uh, um, different armies may take also different takes how close this nexus needs to be. Um, nature, as we, as we have heard before, refers to the intrinsic character of an object. So very clearly, if you have a weapon system, missile launching site, or similar objects, they are military objects by nature and can, uh, can be attacked without more. But it's more complex than when it comes to, uh, to the issue of location, purpose, and present use. Present use is easy because you, you look at uh, what, what, what kind of use is made of an object, and if, for instance, uh, a particular object is, object is used um, as, a, as a hideout for a sniper, or if it is used as a weapon storage facility, then, uh, then this may lead to, to a situation that, um, that a purely or well, previously military objective may turn into a military one. Where we have more debate is when it comes to the notion of, of purpose, because purpose is generally defined as intended future use. And intended future use may be quite far-reaching, in a sense. And there it's important to bear in mind this limitation that comes through effective contribution to military action. So it cannot be a very hypothetical um, remote, uh, remote uh, use that, that may be made of, uh, of a particular object. So you must have concrete indications that an object may be used for military purposes, and only then uh, the test would be, would be fulfilled. The other um, important element that you have to keep in mind when you talk about military objectives is the notion of military action that I mentioned. And here, this refers really to, or to objects that, uh, that, um, that contribute to the war fighting capa capabilities of a party and not just to the war sustaining capability of a party, which is, in a, which is more or less the general war effort. The latter would not qualify as military objectives. 
Then the second uh, criterion or the second prong that you have to, uh, to analyze is whether the total partial destruction, ca uh, capture, or neutralization of the target offers a definite military advantage. And here again, through the word definite, uh, it was agreed among states that you have to look into an advantage which is concrete and perceptible. So it was the, uh, the, the, the will of the diplomats and the negotiating states at the time that you exclude uh, merely hypothetical and speculative advantages when you make the assessment. Then another point that is more or less uh, accepted is that you're not just looking at, um, uh, when you look at the military advantage, it's not just the military advantage when you destroy this, this particular object, but you can also take into account the, the attack as a whole, so having a broader concept. But the one thing that is pretty clear in this, uh, this respect, that the, uh, the attack as a whole, as it, as it has been um, declared by a couple of states when they were interpreting this, this rule, must not be confused with the entire war. Because if you have as a military advantage the entire war, it's quite likely that, that nothing would, uh, would in a way trump uh, then this, this advantage and any, anything could, be, could become a military advantage. And the last point that uh, one needs to keep in mind is the, uh, the criterion of, um, of uh, in the circumstances ruling at the time. Again, this is a recognition that the analysis is very much situational. You have to look at the concrete moment once you launch an attack and make an assessment whether an object uh, is a military objective or not. So if it has not yet become a military objective, you can't proceed with the attack. If an object has ceased to have a military function, you have to uh, abandon an attack. And again, in this context, uh, don't forget the, the principle of proportionality. If you have a legitimate military target, still you have to, uh, to make an assessment whether incidental civilian damages and casualties would be excessive um, if they are caused, and then you, have to, uh, to, uh, you, have to, you must not proceed with the attack. Obviously, in densely populated areas, um, the application uh, of, um, of, the, of the rule when it comes to determining whether something is a military objective is a, is a challenging uh, um, exercise, and you have to do it, as I said, on a case-by-case -case basis. So anything which, uh, which contains sweeping or anticipatory qualification of an object are not allowed under international humanitarian law. You have to make the assessment really in each and every uh, case. A particular problem that arises when it comes to, uh, to military objectives is the, the question of dual-use objects. And these are, as we all know, quite often found in... Uh, in densely populated areas. Here again, dual use object is not a legal term. It simply describes an object which has at the same time military and civilian functions. Take an electri electricity power grid, for instance. Obviously used for the military to have air defense uh, operating on the other end side. It's also relevant for, uh, for hospitals and, and other civilian activities. And here, very clearly, if you apply the standards, even a secondary Military use may turn such an object into a, into a military objective. However, before, when deciding on, upon an attack, then the rules of proportionality and precautions in attack must be taken into account and the likely civilian damages that are caused must be, must be assessed in a proper way. Now, moving from, from these two questions, who can be attacked and what can be attacked to, to some more uh, uh, additional rules coming from international humanitarian law, the, the prohibition of indiscriminate attacks and then the rule of proportionality. Indiscriminate attacks, essentially what is covered, all those, uh, those acts which are of a nature to strike military objectives and civilians or civilian objects without uh, distinction. And here you have, just in broad strokes, the prohibition of blind attacks, so meaning that you proceed with an attack without uh, doing proper verification of the nature of, the, of the, uh, the object, and then also the use of particular weapons that are not capable of being directed at a specific, uh, specific military objective. So the V-1 missiles, for instance, that were used in the Second, uh, Second World War, which were sent to London without any type of guidance system, and you never knew where, where, the, uh, where the missiles would, would land. This is a typical case of, of uh, an indiscriminate weapon that cannot be used. Um, sorry? Yeah, there may be, there may then as well uh, other other types of rockets. So if you don't have a proper a proper guidance system that uh, that allows you to uh, to 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 discriminate, they they would be covered by uh, by this prohibition. Now, um, the rule of proportionality, and there I think it's it's also important to bear in mind, and this came uh, came uh, about as well in the talk before. 
for international humanitarian law purposes, you have a very specific definition of, of, uh, of what, uh, what the rule of proportionality tells, which is different from proportionality when it comes to, to use ad bellum for, for self-defense or when it comes to human rights standards on, on proportionality. So under international humanitarian law, the, the only thing that is, that is prohibited is once you attack, once you proceed with an attack against a military objective, you must not cause excessive collateral or incidental damages to, uh, to civilians or, uh, or civilian objects. And the excessiveness is balanced by the losses against then the military advantage that is, um, that is to be gained by, by a particular attack. And that's often the, obviously a very difficult task to weigh because you have to weigh things that are not easily comparable. On the one hand side, something which is very concrete in terms of uh, loss of life and, uh, and destruction. On the other hand side, something which is more relative, which is the military value of, uh, of an operation. So how do you do this, this balancing impact? The important thing is uh, to bear in mind that, uh, that international humanitarian law speaks about excessiveness. And it, it's not just uh, disproportionate in a sense or if you would have a game of 51% versus 49%, uh, that's not what international humanitarian law has in mind. It's, uh, it's the, the notion of excessiveness. Despite all the uh, uncertainties in, in, the, uh, in the interpretation of the rule of proportionalities, there are nevertheless very clear limitations that are set by, by the rule. By, by the notions of concrete and direct military advantage, uh, you have limitations coming uh, to, uh, to the effect that uh, you exclude from this calculation long-term political or other advantages, you exclude um, vague or hypothetical advantages and, uh, and other un indirect advantages, and you exclude as well, and this is, the, this, this is uh, very similar to the notion of uh, the attack as a whole as I presented it before. So just winning the war as such is not, um, is not then a, a criterion that could be used in, uh, in the proportionalities because, again, what could you weigh against winning uh, of the war? You would not have any limitations coming from the principle of, of proportionality. Um, another point that is important to bear in mind uh, when you assess the, the incidental damages to civilians and civilian objects, you have, to, you have to factor in, in the balancing act as well, the foreseeable reverber reverberating effects of an attack. So just to, to come back to, to my example that I, that I used uh, with the uh, power grid, obviously you have a military value in destroying it because you want to eliminate the, the air defense um, of, uh, of, of a party to an armed conflict. On the other hand side, you must be aware, and you know it perfectly well, that, that it will also have an impact on the running of hospitals and other facilities. So not the immediate effects of, uh, of the attack itself, but you have then knock-on effects that will be created. And these effects uh, you have to bear in mind as well when you make the, the proportionality uh, assessment. Um, an important point in, uh, when it comes to, uh, to applying the rules on, the, on, the, on uh, uh, discrim indiscriminate attacks and also proportionality and then also precautions is when it comes to the choice of the means and methods of warfare to, uh, that would be used in, uh, in densely populated areas. And there we have very specific, uh, specific concerns once, um, once it is related to the way uh, specific weapons function and uh, because of the, uh, the explosive power that they may have. And there's quite a lot of debate when it comes to the use of certain explosives in densely populated areas. Depending on the impact area of, of such weapons, there is a heightened risk of uh, causing um, indiscriminate effects among the civilian population. So whenever you have a significant um, degree of inaccuracy or when you have a wide destructive radius, then the use of such explosives may be of particular concern in densely populated areas. And in the past conflicts, the ICSE has therefore expressed concern about the use in urban areas of high explosive airdrop bombs, artillery, mortars and munitions containing white, white phosphorus. The concerns about high explosive airdrop bombs, artillery, mortar shells is generally due to the difficulty of directing such weapons at specific, specific military objectives and their potentially wide explosive footprint. Their use in densely populated areas raises therefore serious concerns under the provisions that are outlined, uh, the indiscriminate attack uh, prohibition and then also proportionality. Um, and then when you look at precautions, you have to bear in mind that there is also a rule that, uh, that requires uh, specifically that you have to take all feasible precautions to avoid and in any event minimize incidental civilian casualties and damage to civilian objects, notably in the choice of means and methods of warfare. So this would then potentially require that other, 
alternative, more discriminate means of attacking military objectives located in the densely populated areas must be used instead of uh, free flight uh, projectiles fired by artillery or mortars. And this is due to this, uh, this, um, this difficulty or the, the likely, uh, likelihood of, uh, of important humanitarian consequences and violations of, uh, of the rules that are mentioned, the ICSC has taken the approach that explosive weapons with a wide area a wide impact area should be avoided in densely populated areas. Now, continuing with, uh, with the precautions in attack, and there are the general rules that constant care must be uh, taken to spare the, civilian, um, uh, the civilians and civilian objects from the effects of an attack. And this means, in particular, that you have to do everything feasible to verify that targets are military objectives and taking all feasible precautions in the choice of means and methods of warfare with a view to avoiding and in, in, any ways, uh, in any event minimizing the incidental civilian casualties. And this, uh, as said before, is particularly um, important to be done in, uh, in densely populated areas where you have the likelihood of, uh, of civilian casualties. Another um, important feature is the, the issue of advance warning that needs to be given. Again, here, nothing impossible is required because the law already said that you have to issue advance warning uh, only when, when circumstances uh, permit if, uh, if a particular attack may affect the civilian population. So in the law was already built in, if you may have a surprise attack that uh, you can dispense of, of warnings. But if you can proceed with warnings, they should be done. Then the question is what type of warning do you need to, uh, you need to do? And we would advocate that, um, that to be effective in terms of warnings, you should look at it from the, uh, from the point of view of the civilian population to receive it. So you have to make sure that as many civilians as possible in the, in the area um, would, uh, would, uh, would obtain these warnings and that the warnings would be done in a language that they understand as well. The other, on the other hand side, it should be avoided to, uh, to issue prematurely or uh, untimely uh, such warnings because then uh, civilians may not may, uh, take it seriously when it really, uh, really counts. But again, everything depends on the circumstances and you have to assess on a case by case what type of warning is, is really, uh, really required. Linked to that, uh, one has to bear in mind that warning uh, is not the only, uh, the only way to protect the civilian population. The other precautionary measures need to be taken as well. So if, if uh, despite the warning, civilians would stay in a particular area because of ver various reasons they can't leave, still you have to take, uh, take into account or try to, uh, to take precautionary measures and you cannot treat them as simply as, as legi a legitimate target or assume that they are legitimate targets uh, because they stayed in a, in a particular area. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning of the precautions, they are subject to the, to the condition of feasibility. And the notion of feasibility has been generally understood as uh, precautions which are practical, uh, practicable and practically possible, taking into account all the circumstances ruling at the time, including humanitarian and military considerations. So again, inbuilt in the, in the rule is that military considerations can, can be uh, factored in at the same time as humanitarian, but it's not just one or the other. So it's really the, the approach of international humanitarian law that you, are, that you have, uh, proceed to a proper, a proper balancing. And obviously, in, in, under these circumstances, the, the, the issue of force protection comes into play. Obviously, for, uh, the, the, the lives of soldiers and the protection of soldiers is a military consideration. And uh, then you have to balance really the, the, the two things. International humanitarian law doesn't give, you, doesn't give you a guidance how much weight you have to give. But one thing is clear, that you cannot just dispense of taking precautions in attack to, uh, to the ultimate um, uh, benefit of just protecting the soldier's life. So you have to find a proper balancing between, uh, between uh, the, the two. And one thing is also clear, to use force protection as a justification for not complying with other rules of international humanitarian law, that, that is something that international humanitarian law does not justify. So to, to proceed to indiscriminate fire in violation of, of the prohibition of indiscriminate attacks, that would certainly not, uh, not be allowed by the international humanitarian law. But you can, for instance, factor in when, when it comes to intelligence gathering. If you, if, you don't, if you can't, under particular circumstances, do more to verify really that, uh, that a military objective is, uh, or that, uh, that the target is, uh, is military in nature or in use, but you have sufficient indication that subjectively you can come to the conclusion that, uh, that, uh, that the object is, uh, can be attacked, then you can proceed, even if you're wrong, then in the end, by hindsight. So nothing impossible is really required from, uh, from, from the soldiers in, in, uh, in uh, complying with the rules. 
Um, the other issue that uh, that always comes then uh, then as well, and to a certain extent it was mentioned at, uh, at, at a previous uh, moment, international humanitarian law also has obligations on the side of the uh, of the side that is uh, that is object of an attack. So the uh, the side must uh, must as well take necessary precautions with a view to protecting civilians and civilian objects under its control against the dangers resulting from military operations. It's clear they have the first-hand control over the civilians and they have to take specific measures. But again, international humanitarian law has the, the relative nature inbuilt. It's to the maximum extent feasible. So in the same way as for the attacker, also for the defender, you have then the weighing between military considerations on the one hand side and then uh, the humanitarian as, uh, aspect on the other hand side. Um, however, where international humanitarian law, three more minutes, sorry, okay, very briefly, where international humanitarian law uh, is, is absolutely clear in, in terms of absolute prohibition that, uh, that relates to, uh, to the use of human shields, so there is no justification for, for doing it, it is, it is prohibited by international humanitarian law and also um, a war crime. Where it's getting then complex and complicated is if if human shields are nevertheless used by, by a party in, uh, in violation of the obligation, what, uh, what can a commander then do when, uh, when, when he faces such a, such a situation? And there it's also clear, based on international humanitarian law, it does not necessarily prevent him from, uh, from, uh, from attacking. But what is required by international humanitarian law that still uh, precautions in attack and also the rule of proportionality would be applied when it comes to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to a situation where, where uh, um, human shields are used. The second uh, question that arises, and this is particularly related to, uh, to voluntary human shields, can we consider voluntary human shields as being uh, persons who directly participate in hostilities, with the consequence that, on the one hand side, they could be directly attacked, and the, the other thing is would be, uh, that they would not f be factored in when, when it comes to the rule of proportionality. And the approach that uh, the ICSC has taken in its interpretive guidance on, on direct participation uh, in, in hostilities is, is as follows. We have said, whenever you have a situation where human shields, voluntary human shields, are creating a physical obstacle to prevent activities by the, uh, by the, uh, by the opposing armed forces, at that moment, moment when you have this, uh, this, uh, this, this obstacle, then they, they could be seen as taking a direct part in hostilities. However, if they are not creating this, uh, this physical obstacle, then you have to uh, then they would remain protected. They are not directly participating in hostilities. Obviously, by being present or close to a military, a military target, they, have also, they run the risk of being then collateral damage and, and uh, then also facing um, the possibility of death or injuries. Uh, very briefly to conclude, um, asymmetry has always been, uh, is certainly causing a problem in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in contemporary armed conflicts, and there have been quite a lot of remarks that because of asymmetry, we have to change the, the rules, and we have to develop the, the rules. We are not of that, that opinion. Asymmetry is not something that, is, uh, that, that can be solved by legal, legal development, because what is the situation uh, that we are facing? Take the example of a military weaker party that, that can be tempted to, uh, to, to proceed to certain activities that are in violation of international immunity, and not simply because they want to avoid to being targeted by more sophisticated uh, opposing sides. So they may proceed to coming, uh, commingling uh, within the, the, the civilian population. They may feign uh, protected persons, uh, status. Then on the other hand side, you may have the, the stronger party who is then tempted to relieve the standards when it makes the assessment of proportionality, having a broader understanding of what is permissible based on the judgment of the military advantage and, and so forth. So what you can create in such a situation is simply a downward spiral of non-respect of international humanitarian law. Our sense is that in these, these situations it remains crucial that the values and the, 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 the importance of the rules as they were developed at the time and it was also at the time where asymmetries uh, 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 existed that these values must be uphold. What we have to do is much more to look into, into how the rules of international humanitarian law must be applied in, in particular circumstances. And as I've tried to demonstrate as well, you have rules that are, particular, that are drafted in a way that they can be applied in different situations. But we have to talk then more closely how we interpret the specific rules in particular situations. But the values and principles that remain in international humanitarian law remain unchanged, and we think it is all a, it's a goal of all of us to, to defend and uphold these principles also in the, in the future. Thank you very much.